Yeah. This is Geek Therapy Radio. What are we waiting for? And now your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. All right, I did a write-up for this because there's just an incredible amount of information to get through. So <laughs> let's just dive in. All right, first things first, before we talk about the new Nintendo Switch Lite, you may have seen a lot of clickbait surrounding Nintendo regarding the 3DS platform being quote-unquote dead. That somehow this Nintendo Switch Lite is the nail in the coffin for the Nintendo 3DS platform. That is completely not true. Like I said, It's clickbait. So first things first, take the clickbait with a grain of salt. The 3DS platform is most certainly not dead, at least not yet. Nintendo says it will continue to support the platform as long as demand for it persists. And more on that demand in a moment. While Nintendo has no plans for more more first-party releases like Mario or Zelda, the 3DS platform is still wide open for third-party developers as always. Online features are still currently fully supported, such as the eShop and online multiplayer. That is, you can still download Smash Brothers and play it with online multiplayer. But remember Nintendo's comment about support as long as demand continues? Let's look at that before we dive into all the Switch Lite news. Since the launch of the original Nintendo Switch, demand for the 3DS platform has sharply declined, naturally, both in hardware and software sales, but it isn't dead yet. According to the last data available, in March 2019, Nintendo still sold over 2.5 million units of hardware worldwide just in that month, the vast majority being the 2DS and 2DS XL. Now, software sales is most interesting as software sales in Japan are far less than the rest of the world. Still, total software software sales were about 13.2 million units. Now, let's think about this. Even if each title cost just $1, that is, you went to the Nintendo eShop and downloaded a game that cost only $1, that's still over $13 million. Now add the $20 titles and the $30 titles and the $60 titles. Nintendo is still generating an incredible amount of money off of the 3DS platform, so they're not going to kill their cash cow. So, is the 3DS platform dead? Absolutely not. And despite a natural decline in sales, it's far from the grave. I mean, the Wii only breathed its desperate last breath less than a year ago with the elimination of the last remaining streaming services. So, on the Wii, there's no more Netflix, no more Hulu, none of that. They, they, it was the final nail in the Wii's coffin, and that was only less than a year ago. And the Wii's been out since 2006. So yes, the 3DS platform is nowhere near its prime, but it still draws a healthy crowd in the minor leagues, largely helped by the cheap cost of entry. The 2DS costs as little as $80 brand new, which brings us nicely to the Nintendo Switch Lite. The Switch Lite launches September 20th of 2019 and will cost just $200. I say just. It's all relative. I mean, $200 is nothing to sneeze at. Anyway, anyways, that's $100 cheaper than the original vanilla Switch. This $200 is also a far cry from the $80 2DS, but it will absolutely cannibalize hardware sales of the newest 3DS XL. Again, not the death blow for the 3DS platform as a whole, but possibly just the most expensive version of the 3DS. So let's talk about what you get for $200 with the Nintendo Switch Lite. The most obvious difference is the built-in and lightly redesigned controls. Since this is a handheld focused device, we get a new left D-pad. Nice. I like that. It's like a D-pad, like the original NES controller. It's really cool. Joy-Cons will still be compatible for pairing, however. Also, will Nintendo have fixed the Joy-Con drift issue? I can only hope Nintendo is aware of it enough to make sure the Switch Lite resolves this issue. And a quick side note for those unaffected, or yet to be, 
Joy-Con drift is when one or more of your analog sticks uh, switches is broken altogether or constantly pulls your character or screen cursor in one direction. It'd be like your mouse on your computer constantly moving by itself to one side of the screen or not moving at all with input. For the Joy-Con, the fix is relatively cheap and simple. There are plenty of tutorials. Order a new thumbstick on Amazon. It's like 10 or 12 bucks. Manipulate a few tiny screws and that's it. I've done it myself. It was really easy. It took maybe five minutes. Still, it shouldn't be an issue at all, and one would only hope that Nintendo uses better thumbstick hardware in the Switch Lite, especially if the entire reason for its existence is increased portability. Ease of thumbstick repair on the Switch Lite is to be determined if you know needed at all. Sure, repairing Joy-Cons yourself is way cheaper, but most people can't be bothered and shouldn't have to pay for repairs or drop upwards of $80 on a new pair of Joy-Cons. They just, the controls just shouldn't be broken, period. And hopefully they won't be on the new Switch Lite. And I, for people with the original vanilla Switch, like me, don't worry too much about that. If you if you treat your Switch with, with care and you don't just bash it around, you shouldn't get the Joy-Con drift issue. Um, you shouldn't get it. Could you get it? Sure. But just, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Anyways, back to the Switch Lite. The next and perhaps most polarizing change is the omission of TV compatibility. You can't put it into a cradle and play on the big screen like the original vanilla Switch. I was supremely disappointed by this at first. I mean, I'm still disappointed, but the more I think about it, I can see why Nintendo did this. First, this is $200. If the $200 Switch Lite connects to your TV just like the $300 version, would you spend the extra $100? Most people wouldn't cough up the extra $100, or at least Nintendo thinks so. That being said, if the $200 Switch Lite did plug into the TV, people would have to buy more Pro Controllers and Joy-Cons to play from the couch, because remember, with the Switch Lite, the controls are built in. You can't detach them. So if you were to plug it into your TV, you would need to buy extra controllers, wireless controllers, to play from your couch. Uh, anyways, if you bought a Switch Lite and the extra Joy-Cons, however, that's almost $300 right there. So, Switch Lite is $200, an extra set of Joy-Cons is $80, that's $280, almost $300, almost the cost of the original Switch. That's fine for one player, however, and two in a pinch if you share a Joy-Con like was originally designed for. For the sake of this argument, I'll cap the speculation and spending combinations right there. All you need to know is that Nintendo doesn't want to chew into sales of the $300 Switch, so it has omitted TV compatibility. But the $200 Switch already chews into Switch sales by default. Oh my goodness. All right, let's move on. It does my head in to think about Nintendo's reasoning. Oh, to be a fly on the wall in that meeting. Before we move on to more specs and features, I will say that eliminating de can I talk? Eliminating detachable Joy-Cons and the ability to play on your TV completely eviscerates the name Switch. It's a Nintendo Switch that doesn't switch. By definition, the Switch Lite is no longer a Switch at all. You're not switching anything. You aren't switching from console mode to portable mode. It's only one mode, portable. They should have just called it the Nintendo Portable. I know, it sounds stupid. I agree. But is it any more stupid than the Wii U? Or Windows going from 8 to 9? Or Apple resetting the iPad nomenclature back to just iPad? Or NVIDIA calling the NVIDIA GTX 1080 the 1080? People are going to con confuse by that, and we're confused. 10 does that mean 1080p? What, what does 1080 mean? I'm just saying. A lot of companies have gone with wacky nomenclature for their new products, so calling it the Nintendo Portable wouldn't have been any more confusing. I mean, I guess it would be. Nintendo Portable, at least to be accurate, what Nintendo Portable? The Game Boy? The DS? The 3DS? I mean, they're all portable. The freaking undocked Switch? That's portable, too. Whatever. I digress. It's not a Switch anymore. <laughs> it doesn't switch. All that being said... To my knowledge, incompatibility with a TV dock is merely a software lockout. Don't quote me on that, but that's just what it seems. The USB-C connection is still there on the Switch Lite. 
I mean, yes, it definitely won't fit in the current dock, but if it's just a software lockout, perhaps Nintendo will unlock the feature in the future? I'm not holding my breath, but it would be nice. If someone can shed some light onto whether or not the display lockout is physical or software, please let me know on the Geek Therapy Radio Facebook page. I'm sure it will come to light soon. Get it? Anyways, moving on. The Switch Lite is smaller. Screen size comes in at 5.5 inches diagonally diagonally compared to the original vanilla Switch's 6.2 inches. This means more densely packed pixels while retaining the original 1280 by 720 resolution and therefore a sharper image. For overall size and weight, the light comes in at 3.6 inches tall and 8.2 inches wide, down from 4 inches and 9.4 inches respectively on the original. Weight also comes down to 0.61 pounds versus the original's 0.88. So it's physically smaller and lighter than the original Nintendo Switch, which makes sense because it's called the Switch Lite. Other eliminations include Joy-Con rumble, the HD rumble in the Joy-Cons, the vibrations, and the IR camera in the Joy-Cons. However, these features will be enabled on any paired Joy-Cons. So if you pair extra Joy-Cons to the device over Bluetooth or whatever, the IR camera and the HD rumble will be on original Joy-Cons paired to the system. Just not on the built-in controls themselves. These, compared to the smaller screen size, means an increased battery life. Nintendo claims an increase in playtime by about 20 to 30 percent versus the original. Nintendo also says the battery life increase is partially due to a quote more power efficient chip layout unquote. This makes me add another question to the TV docking question. If it's a less powerful chip, maybe it's not designed to kick into boost mode like the original Switch, allowing for better frame rates and 1080p. Then again, why would that matter? Just keep the light at 720p and simply pass through the display output to the TV. You don't have to upscale or do anything like that. Just simply mirror the image, pass it right through. Also, quote, more efficient chip layout, unquote, doesn't necessarily mean a lower powered processor. It could more likely simply mean more efficient components like capacitors, resistors, ICs, and shorter circuit traces, any combination of which would result in increased power efficiency. Now we're getting bogged down yet again with the speculation. The Switch Lite does keep near field communication or NFC for supporting things like Amiibo. It does get rid of the kickstand, which makes sense given the exclusively handheld nature of the Switch Lite. The kickstand was terrible anyways. I just called it what it really is. The SD card cover. Oh man, what else? Oh, the backlight control. It's manual backlight control. No more ambient light sensor. And I'm okay. I'm really completely okay with this. Automatic brightness can be finicky and annoying. I often prefer manual control, which in the uh, Nintendo Switch, vanilla Nintendo Switch, original Nintendo Switch, you can turn off automatic brightness and control it manually yourself. But on the Switch Lite, it's all manual manual control, which is fine. I prefer that. The last feature I'll mention comes to your Nintendo account itself. It was a massive, massive pain in the butt when you replaced your 3DS or bought a backup. For instance, keeping your original 3DS and also buying a 3DS XL. Now you have two 3DSs. You were only allowed one Nintendo account at a time per device, meaning you could re-download everything you already own on your extra device, but you either had to transfer your account to one device along with software, which was a maddeningly slow process, or create a new account for the new device. For instance, I have two Nintendo accounts, one for my original 3DS and the Switch, and one for my 3DS XL. So two accounts across those devices. I only have Mario Kart 7 on my 3DS XL. If I want it on both, I'd have to go to my first 3DS and pay full price for it again on that other account. It's a freaking nightmare. That's all you need to take away from that is that Nintendo account across multiple Nintendo devices is a nightmare, especially if they are the same device. Well, it still sucks if you have two Switches, but at least it's a little 
a little better now. If you have an original Switch and buy a Switch Lite, you can use the same account, but the secondary device must be connected to an internet connection to play duplicate software. For instance, if you buy Smash Brothers on your original Switch, then buy the Switch Lite, you can download it again on your Switch Lite, but can only play it thereafter with an internet connection. So what that means is, you can't play Smash Brothers on your Switch Lite, you know, the second copy of Smash Brothers on your Switch Lite if you're camping in the boonies, unless you have a Wi-Fi tether to your phone, if you even have a phone signal. So if you're out in the boonies, you have no Wi-Fi signal, have no nothing, but you have your Switch Lite and your second copy of Smash Brothers, you can't play it because you don't have an internet connection. So as far as your Nintendo account and the eShop is concerned, it's still a pain in the butt, but just slightly less. Alrighty, let's wrap this up with my personal opinion of the Switch Lite, and I'll start with the pros and Joy-Cons, get it, of what I was originally hoping for. Alright, pros and cons, seriously. I was originally hoping for a clamshell design. Since I knew this would be a strictly portable device, I thought maybe screen and button protection would be built into the design, sort of like a souped up 3DS. One of my main gripes with the vanilla Switch was that while it was portable, you still needed to treat it delicately, both with the screen and controls. Matter of fact, I promise a lot, if not most, of the Joy-Con drifting issues can be a direct result of the thumbsticks snagging and bending and being broken during transport in a purse, bag, or backpack, or whatever. I always thought the portability aspect suffered if it meant I needed a bulky case and accessories to transport it safely. In other words, it's, if it's so portable, it's less portable if I need a big bulky case for it, and I need to put it on this protective coverings to take it. That's not, that kind of defeats the purpose of portability at that point. So while I absolutely do appreciate the landscape uh, control layout from a comfort perspective, part of me wished for a more rugged clamshell design. That said, if Nintendo has made the Switch Lite's thumbsticks more durable this time around, it'll be a non-issue. As for controls, it's a con that the light omits HD rumble. The IR camera omission, omission makes sense since the controls aren't detachable in the first place, but it's kind of silly really that HD rumble got the axe. Some people won't care, but I like the option of having it or disabling it myself. A big pro, however, is the new left D-pad. I haven't used it yet, obviously, but I expect it to pass the Hadouken test with ease. Hadouken! Down forward punch, baby. To conclude, all things considered, I am excited for it, and I will most likely wind up buying one. Maybe not on launch day, but probably within a few weeks or at least a few months after. It really seems that, just like the 2DS, a large component to Nintendo's consideration for the Switch Lite is kids. I bet a lot of mommies and daddies will prefer to save $100 for this less fragile, more kid-friendly version. I'd wager that the vast majority of children already use the vanilla Switch almost exclusively undocked while mom and dad watch Netflix or play Xbox on the living room TV. Also, I like the idea of keeping a smaller Switch in my backpack exclusively. Remember, I quite often think twice about bringing my vanilla switch anywhere unless I can safely transport it. Transport it. I carried it in my backpack quite often, actually, until I found the left uh, thumbstick at the bottom of the backpack. I can't be alone in that scenario. And yes, that's ultimately on the end user to properly care for their electronics. But since I bought my Game Boy Pocket back in 1998, I've never had to repair it. It has spent literal decades being thrown in bags, pockets, and being tossed around willy-nilly. So if the main selling point of the Switch Lite is portability, it better be much, much tougher than the vanilla Switch. So overall, I think it's really cool, and I will definitely buy one in time. But... I struggle to recommend it to people who are already 100% happy with their existing Switch. In other words, if you already have a Switch, the Switch Lite is a novelty. But I personally want the novelty, and it will be interesting to see how many people share the sentiments. 
That's it for Midweek Geek this week. Take care, embrace your inner geek, lean into your inner geek, be good to yourselves and others, and I'll see you in the next one.